Alright, so 69% battery is a perfect time to start a new lecture. So for this lecture, we, our main theorem is the Laurent series development and the um, Sorority Wallstress theorem. Okay, so before that, there's something from last lecture I need to be clarified. Okay, so <clears throat> is that is is about the the pole like if we have a pole of order m do we have g and g is analytic in the disk okay so so f z okay so here say that suppose f has a pole of z equals a then you have a removable near z equals a right Which means that then we have found if it's removable, then we have analytic extension of this as z. Uh, I mean, the zero is analytic, right? And h is equal to zero, then we have another function, right? H z is kind of expressed as this for some h one analytic with h a not zero, right? So we have this for z not equals to a. And this function has a removable as z equals to a, right? That if we compute the limit here. So this function can be extended to another gz, where g is analytic in BRA, right? So the key point now is that as this thing as z goes to a, right? This thing as z goes to a is equal to 1 over h1a, right? So it's equal to ga, which is not 0, right? So so if we can express like this, then ga is not equal to 0, okay? So this is uh, ga, it's not equal to 0. We never chosen this for any m, right? Okay, so with this in mind, with this in mind, okay, we move on to our uh, theorem. So before that, there's a lemma here, 5.1. So you can read the statement. The proof will be omitted. So if you need a proof, just uh, leave a comment below. So I'll prove it next time. Okay, so for time consuming, I'll just skip the proof. And we're going to use this a lot. So um, here comes the theorem. Lorentz series development. So if f is analytic in an analyst, then we have a series that is expressed like this. The convergence is absolutely uniform over the closure of this analyst when the two radius is in between them. And the coefficients are given by this. Where gamma is the circle, so the gamma is the circle for any R. And the series is unique. Alright, so to prove this, first, if we have this for gamma 1, gamma 2 are circles, such that this is a circle with this, this circle with this, radius, then they're homotopic in the analysis. Why? Because if we write gamma 1 as this and gamma 2 as this, right? If we write it like this, for any point z here, we have this, uh, we have this, uh, I mean, representation, right? So this is gamma 2, I mean, this is gamma 1 s, and this is gamma 2 s, right? Right. So, if we define the homotopic function gamma s t to be defined like this, then we see that it has the required uh, values, and we have this gamma is continuous. Why? Because so here's the here's the proof. If we're s t in the unit square, 
Well, we let delta 1 chosen so that we have this, and delta 2 chosen so that this is true. It will delta be the minimum of these three so that whenever we have this, right? So we want to estimate this, right? So here you will see that our our choice of this, we're, we're, we're going to use it. So first we have to estimate this sum, right? So we just plug in and then we use triangle inequality. And notice that this part and this part, the only difference is the index, right? So we just show this one. So for this one, we add and subtract this term and we break it apart. And t is less than or equal to one, so it gives this. And this one, this is bounded, right? This is less than R2, right? Less than R2. Because gamma 1 has not. I mean, we have this, right? Gamma 1 is R1 of this. So R, R1 is less than R2. I mean, I mean, it's not necessary. Okay. It's um, A plus R2. Yeah. It should be, should be A plus norm is But, okay, anyways, I mean, you have A here, and you have this, right? So it is already bounded. So no matter what, it is bounded, okay? So we don't need to be precise as long as it is bounded, right? So we just choose this to be, like, to be M, okay? So now we have that, well, this less than epsilon, this less than epsilon, and this... We do the same thing, and this, we do the same thing. So in total, is less than 5 as well, so they're homotopic, right? So this continues. Okay. It is not hard, right? <coughs> so we have that. If R1, R2 are the circle, then they're homotopic, right? So if G is analytic and an analyst, then their integral is 0. So in particular... This integral is independent of the choice of r, right? So for each n, a n is constant. So if we define a n to be this, this is constant, right? For, I mean, for any circle, right, they're the same. It is independent of the radius r because if we have this, they're homotopic. Right? So n is a constant. Be good. n is a constant. So this is the key result we have proven. Okay, so these are some um, preparation. We're gonna start proving. So now we define a function f two. When um, r two lies between them. Okay. Define function f2 defined by on the analyst such that it is equal to this. All right. So we just pick an r2. I mean r2 doesn't really matter, right? Because they're all the same. It is well defined. I mean this integral is always the same, right? So it's well defined and it's analytic by lemma five point one. Okay. If you apply the lemma here. This is your f, fw, and m is equal to 1, okay? So look, right, 1 f phi w, okay? So it is analytic, right? Because our theorem states that each of them is analytic. And we have this, um, we have this formula. We're going to use it later, okay? So it is analytic. Similarly, if we define h to be this, so it outside R1, okay? Then we define F1 by this. 
whenever R1 is between little R1, um, big R1, and big R2. And it is analytic NH. Okay. All right. So now we have to find F2 and F1, right? So now for any point Z in the analyst, we pick R1, R2. So shall we have this? So we like gamma 1 be the circle, R1, gamma 2 be the circle with radius R2. So here's the diagram, right? Here's the diagram. And now we define another function g on the analyst be equal to define like this. So with this definition, it is analytic and on the analyst except for the point z, right? Because we have this. And it is continuous on the entire domain. Also, g has a removable singularity at zeta equal to g and zeta equal to z. If it looked like this, and we let that goes to this is zero, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly what I'm saying. So we can extend G to G tilde, it is analytic in an analyst. And we have this, right? But Z is not on a trace of the either curve. So we can just we can just change it to G. Which we get this. Now, when we think about the winding numbers, right? Z is here, the winding number of this curve is zero, the winding number of this curve around Z is one, right? So, we have this. Just, just simplify it, we get this. And we isolate at Z, we have this. Well, precisely, this is equal to F2, this is equal to F1. Surprise, right? So, our goal now is to expand F1, F2 in power series. We start with the easy one, F2. We know that F2 is analytic, right? And we have this. And we have this by lemma 5.1. I mean, and we have this, we apply lemma 5.1 with fm to be equal to this and fw to phi w so f1z which is which is f2z and we get the nth derivative of this well just take a derivative multiple times which is n factor times this well which is this and a n right we have a parity expansion we know that the, the coefficient of an is actually equal to this, which is equal to this. So it is as claimed, right? We have this, right? Um, n plus one, it's not the n plus one, yeah. The, the, the variable of integral doesn't matter, right? So yeah, n plus one. Okay. So now we go on the difficult one, F1. So to start, we need to do some preparation. So we define GZ when your input is in here, we define GZ as F1 plus A of one over Z. Okay. So here we have this, which means that A plus one over Z is an analyst of R1 to infinity. Okay, so it is outside the radius R1, okay? A plus one over Z, F1 of it, which is exactly our definition, okay? And as we have this, and GZ is defined when we have this, right? Because the problem occurs when this was, happens equal to zero when we integrate, right? When this is equal to zero, which is precisely our 
um, Rz, right? Rz here, we have 1 plus Z and A. If it's equal to R1, then it lies on a circle. So it is defined when this is not equal to R1, <laughs> right? So, well, why not? If it's, why don't we just focus on this domain, right? So it is analytic for all A plus 1 over Z with its input greater than R1, which is equivalent to Z, which is equivalent to this inequality. Okay, so now we know that G has isolated singularity as Z equals zero, right? Because G is analytic for all MA equals one over Z with this, right? With this. So G has isolated singularity as Z equals zero. So our key is to show that G has a removable one. To show that it has a removable one, then how? It suffices to show that this, right? Because if this limit exists, then z zero z g z is equal to zero times something c, which gives you zero, <laughs> right? So if this limit exists, then we're done. To show this limit exists, now we're gonna do something. For R between R1 and R2, okay? So we now have R1 and R2. Pick a new R between them. Well, we're always choosing like between between. Well, this is doable because by the um, by the property of reals. Right? <laughs> so Z is in the analyst on here. So Z is here. So here is A, R1. This this little r one and we define a new r. We let c be the circle, and we have z here and we have p z. P z is the distance from z to the circle. Where c is this circle with radius r one. We let m be the supremum of f w on on a compact set. Okay, it's a continuous function on a compact set. <laughs> so we can have we have like extreme value theorem right so now this is equal to this so they're homotopic remember right remember they're homotopic and yes homotopic and we have so this is 2 pi r and the supremum times the supremum of this less than the supremum of this is less than equal to this the upper bound of this times the upper bound of this. Well, one over w minus z gets big when w minus z small. Right. So when we're at the infimum, right, which which is with the reciprocal is the biggest so we have this well no matter what is a constant <laughs> so now we have this could be less than any epsilon because as z goes to infinity the p z goes to infinity so this can be made less than any epsilon so f1 z so it can be less than epsilon as z goes to infinity right so we have this if we have this, then as z equals zero, g z is equal to this. But a plus one over z goes to infinity, right? As z goes to zero, so which is something like this. So g has removable as z equals zero, right? Okay, is it removable as z equals zero? And we have this. Right, so we can extend a new function which is defined g zero to a zero. So g is analytic on on this. <laughs> okay? G is analytic on this. But r greater than r1 was arbitrary. 
So this is arbitrary. So G is analytic on this disk. Okay. So from here, if you're analytic on this disk, you're analytic on a disk, then we have a power series uh, representation, right? With B not equal to zero because G is zero, zero. So we start from one. So you might guess, well, this starts from one. So eventually, like, this starts from one. So when we're taking negatives, we start from negative one, right? All the key starts from here. Like all the key, all the process is like been done previously, hiddenly, right? So this is the, this is the beauty, right? Or it is really hard to handle mathematics like this. I know. So. We have a power series expansion of G. We want to return back to F1, right? F1 is equal to this, is equal to this. And now, before this, we need a theorem. So in general, we have a change of variable for a contour integral, provided everything is like well-defined, well, everything is good. We have the contour integral is we have the change of variable of a contour integral. Whenever sigma, sigma is a sigma is a path, sigma is a curve. Okay. So if we define sigma t be a curve, then the left hand side, right, if we expand this, is this f of h of sigma t times the derivative of h of sigma t. This Right. which is we apply the chain rule we got this and for the right hand side if we just we just follow by the definition of line integral this we, we just bring this sigma inside right this times h prime of sigma t and then we after this we just multiply by sigma t dt and we see that they're the same right so we can we can do the change of variables for the line integrals. So we can apply it in our case. So usually, I mean, originally we have our function like this, right? Like this. So we want to change this w to a plus one over w. So this is our h, okay? Then, Eventually, right, then gamma, I mean, you just, you just take a look, okay, you just take a look at those. <laughs> so, this integral, we just, we just change this to h, okay, dh, and gives this of f of h of w, h of w of a minus 1 over z, times a prime w dw. So, this part is this part, right? And this part is this part. So here's sigma, our original curve is gamma point one, gamma prime one, right? And h takes gamma prime one to gamma one, right? Which is exactly what we want. So this of h dh is equal to this. And h of w is equal to this. Right? So we have, we just plug in, we have this. Um, time multiplied by this. All right? So now we just simplify this expression to this. Okay? We simplify to this. As equal to gz. Right? H1z is equal to gz. So we have gz is equal to this. Okay? Now, as above, we have G is analytic on a disk, right? So its power expansion right, is equal to this. Now we by apply lemma, apply lemma to this function, and hz is equal to z of 2 pi, because we have this one, z 2 pi, and f1z is equal to this. We apply the product rule, right? We have the product rule, which is equal to this. So, right, 
I mean, you have g is equal to this, and you just take the derivative with respect to z multiple times, and you got you got something like this. And this hz has an isolated z here, but when you're taking zero, right, this goes to zero, so this term vanishes. The left here, where we're left this, well, which gives us this, right? And so bn is equal to bn is equal to distance divided by n factorial. So bn is the, like we just take we just cancel the diff n factorial, right? So now we want to change this back to this. Basically, the function is the inverse of h, right? So the inverse of h is one over w minus a. So we're just doing the same thing here. We got this. So here the negative sign finally appears, right? So define a of negative n to be equal to bn, then we're done. So we have f1 of this as equal to this for this, right? Um, but if we let w equals to a plus 1 over z, then f1 of w is equal to bn of this, which is equal to bn is equal to a of negative n, right? Well, so we swap it, we got this. Ah, yeah. So f1w, we have a parasitic expression of f1w. So our final goal is to show that it converges. F2 is easier, right? It, it converges uniformly, absolutely, on the, despite, uh, despite our previous result already, like a long time ago. Similarly, for GZ, right? We know GZ converges absolutely and uniformly on this. Right? So F1z is equal to this. It converges absolutely and uniformly when our input here, z minus a, um, 1 over z minus a is between this. Or we have this, which means that, right, which means it converges uniformly when, when we have this. So this converges absolutely and uniformly on the closure of the analyst of this, okay? So the part where the Lorentz expression is unique is left as an exercise, okay? So like if you, if, you really, if you really want me to do it, you just drop a comment and I'll do it next time, okay? And so now we're going to use Laurent to classify singularity. So we have proven, we have proven this theorem. Okay, we have proven this theorem. So to classify singularities. Um, so if we have an isolated singularity and we'd have the Lorentz expansion at the punctured neighborhood, then we have these three. So you could just take a time and read it. Take some time and read it. And the proof is really easy. So, if all the negative terms are zero, we let gz is equal to this. Then g is equal to f on the disk. But this function is analytic, right? So it is a removable one. For converse, we let this be an analytic extension. By using this of Laurent, all the negative ones are the zero, right? Uniqueness of Lorentz. Now, for B, so suppose we have this, right? So this is the last one that vanishes. I mean, that does not vanish. All the ones after it, it vanishes. So the proof is that so if this is the last one to this, if we just multiply it, right? That this is Lorentz expansion with no negative terms. 
which means that it has a removable as it goes A by part A. So it has a pole of order M. So for converse, we just go all the way back. We just go all the way back. Okay. If a part C is a bit more trickier, if it's essential, then this for infinitely many integers. Well. If it's essential, then it's not removable, so there is a negative one. That is not zero. And it's shown it's also not a pole, right? If it's not a pole, it's not a pole of order m for any m, which means that for any m, we have this. For any m, this is false, right? So from now, we can conclude only finally of them, we get a contradiction. Right. So the converse is easy. Okay. So this is a theorem. So we're gonna use it later. So here it comes to the stunning result. It's called the sorority wear stress theorem. So if f has an essential singularity as a equals a, then for any puncture neighborhood, f maps this. The closure of the image of f on the puncture neighborhood is equal to all the complex plane. So it gets really, really close to any complex number. Right? It gets close to any complex number. So to prove this, what, this, what, this is what we want to show. Right? So I'm kind of tired right now. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's late night. So we're assuming for a contradiction. Assume this theorem like it fails to hold. Then we know that there exists a complex number and there exists epsilon such that this for any z and g endless. Right? So if we have this, then then this limit is infinity. Which means that this function has a pole of z equals to a. Right? If this has a pole of z equals a, remember from last lecture, we have something like this, right? So this is equal to this for some h analytic and h a not zero, and k is greater equal to one. Right? From here, from here, right? So we just isolate f z. Okay, we isolate f z. So from here, we have this, right? As a power series expansion. So Fz is equal to this. Notice that a k minus one is non-zero since h a is non-zero, okay? Because h a is equal, h a is equal to this, okay? So this is non-zero. The last it must be non-zero. So if k is equal to one, then we have this. Then a is a removable, right? It is removable. It has a lower zero expansion such that all the negative terms are zero. So it is a removable. And you might also guess that if k is greater than one, there is a pole of order k minus one. Right? Again. Again, again, by, by this, by A and B, right? Or you can just see, is, I mean, you can, you can say C by C because, um, by C because there's only finally of them. But F is essential and implies that it must be infinitely many negative. So no matter what, you get a contradiction. And the theorem is proven. Okay, so that's, that's it for this lecture. I will see you guys next time.